It was January 1848 when James Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill, sparking a gold rush. Tens of thousands of people rushed west in the hopes of a better life. Among them was a group of pioneers who organized in Salt Lake City. The dangers of traversing the Sierra Nevada during winter were far too great, and the 107 wagons in Salt Lake understood this as they prepared to head west in late fall of 1849. As such, the group hoped to travel south along the Old Spanish Trail, a trade route between Santa Fe, New Mexico and Los Angeles, California. Rumor had it that the Old Spanish Trail allowed travelers a safe route to gold country by bypassing the Sierra Nevada altogether. And so, on October 1st, the pioneers set off. However, false shortcuts, difficult terrain, and a shortage of water convinced most of the would-be gold prospectors to turn back north by early November. Only 27 wagons decided to continue. After splitting up for a brief time, the wagons reunited and followed the Amargosa riverbed around to the western side of the Amargosa Mountains. Two months had passed since leaving the Old Spanish Trail in search of a shortcut. However, the most difficult part of the journey was yet to come. Ahead of them lay the Panamint Range, a seemingly impassable wall on the opposite side of the valley. Split on what to do, the wagons split up once more. One group, the Jayhawkers, hoped to exit the valley by crossing the Panamints to the north, but found the route impassable to wheel traffic. Deciding to cross on foot, they broke down the wagons and slaughtered several oxen for food, using the wagons as firewood. The other group, the Ben Hurricane Party, attempted to cross the Panamints to the south. After the attempt failed, two men, William Lewis Manley and John Haney Rogers, were sent out with two weeks of supplies and $30 to bring back relief. After a 600-mile round trip to Mission San Fernando, Manley and Rogers returned 26 days later. By then, some party members had left, hoping to escape on their own. Two families with children remained. Surprisingly, only one man perished as they waited for the return of the two men. It is said as the last survivors finally made their way over the Panamints, someone proclaimed, Goodbye, Death Valley. Death Valley National Park was first established as a monument in 1933, then redesignated as a national park in 1944. Despite the foreboding name, the area has been a center of human habitation for at least the last 10,000 years. The most recent Indian tribe to settle the area were the Timbisha, who arrived approximately a thousand years ago. Timbisha itself refers to their name for Death Valley, the land of red ochre. The red ochre was broken down and used as a face paint and was thought to protect the whole valley. At over 3 million acres, Death Valley is the largest national park outside of Alaska. Some might assume that the park is little more than a vast featureless desert, with nothing but sand and rock everywhere, but it is so much more than that. I first had the chance to visit Death Valley National Park in November of 2021 with my mom and my cousin, who was visiting from Guatemala. We were absolutely awestruck. We hadn't even left Panamint Valley on the drive home, and I was already thinking about how soon I could come back. My partner and fiancé Sydney, and my friends since middle school Luis and Angel decided to join. Death Valley is infamous for its scorching temperatures. In the summer, temperatures can stay above 100 degrees in the valley even at night. This narrows down the travel season for most people down to fall through spring. Given we would be camping, we didn't want to go midwinter either, when temperatures can drop below freezing and ice can shut down the mountain passes, so we ultimately settled on March. At this time of year, temperatures in the valley hover between high 70s to low 80s, with nighttime temperatures in the mid 50s. The original plan was for everyone to drive to Death Valley on the morning of March 1st. Louise picking up Angel and taking his truck, Sydney riding with me in my hatchback. But Sydney and I really aren't morning people, so we decided to leave the evening before and spend the night in Ridgecrest. Louise and Angel left the first as planned. The drive from Los Angeles to Ridgecrest was mostly uneventful, but I did take a quick detour at Red Rock Canyon State Park along Highway 14 to give my new 18 to 35 mm camera lens a try at some astrophotography. Satisfied with the results, but spooked by a darting shadow against the dimly lit canyon walls, we only spent about 5 minutes before driving on to Ridgecrest, only about 40 minutes further north. Not looking to stay anywhere fancy, we checked in at the local Multiple 6 and settled in for the night. We got up around 7.30am on the 1st and headed off, reaching Searles Lake in the little mining town of Trona at around 
With only three days in the park, we'd only get a taste of what the park has to offer. To get to the park from Trona, we took Trona Wild Rose Road north over the Argus Mountains. This takes us into Panamint Valley. It takes about 45 minutes to get from Trona to the intersection with Panamint Valley Road, but from there, it's only another 15 minutes before officially entering the National Park. The Panamint Mountains and the overall geography of Death Valley National Park are a result of massive tectonic forces at play, working over millions of years. About 17 million years ago, the North American plate started rising and stretching. As the plate stretched, it fractured into blocks bound by north-south trending faults. As the lift continued, the lifted edges of the blocks became mountains, while the parts of the blocks that slipped became valleys. This is what's responsible for the pattern seen in much of the western United States. Basin, range, basin, range, stretching from the Sierra Nevada and Eastern California to as far as the Wasatch Range in Utah. The Panamint Range, as well as Death Valley, are just a part of this pattern. Slowly but surely, the western face of the Panamints is being lifted up, while the eastern face slips. This is a contributing factor to the elevation extremes of Death Valley National Park. Telescope Peak, the tallest point of the Panamints, rises to an elevation of 11,043 feet. Less than 30 miles east, Badwater Basin sits at 282 feet below sea level, the lowest point in North America. The geology of Death Valley itself is a bit more complicated, however. Not only is the crust extending, but Death Valley is bound by two strike-slip faults. Unlike the extension which causes blocks to slip along normal faults and to lift along reverse faults, motion along strike-slip faults is horizontal, with one side of the fault sliding past the other. Because of this, the block on which Death Valley sits sinks even faster. Fast enough, in fact, that the little precipitation that falls in the area doesn't carry enough sediment off the mountains fast enough to fill in the basin resulting in the low elevation at Death Valley. By contrast, much of Panamint Valley sits between 1 to 2,000 feet above sea level. And for the second time, we have made it to Death Valley. Been planning this trip for not quite as long as the, the first one, but at the same time, I somehow feel I'm even more prepared this time. I, I know what to expect. I've learned more photography techniques. Accompanied by my fiance this time. So, I think it's gonna be a good trip. And we're gonna take some photos. While most of Panamint Valley sits outside of Death Valley National Park, there are still a number of sites in the area of interest, both historical and geological. At 65 miles long from north to south, like Death Valley and much of the western US, 
Panamint Valley is surprisingly diverse. Soon after exiting the pass over the Argus Mountains, a dirt road tracks off of Turner Wild Rose Road to the ghost town of Ballarat. Ballarat served as a rest stop for miners in the area from 1897 to 1917 when the post office closed. At its peak, Ballarat was home to up to 500 people. Today, however, Ballarat is home to only one or two full-time residents, who run the general store for tourists. However, I've always been more interested in geology than history, and what caught my attention was the surprising appearance of water in the distance. It's along the southern stretch of Panamint Valley where the lowest point at time fills up to form Lake Panamint, an ephemeral lake that never lasts long. During wetter times, Panamint Lake would however fill up enough to spill over Wingate Pass to the south, and into Death Valley. We were lucky enough to spot Lake Panamint this time, hugging the base of the Panamint Mountains. Following Trona Wild Rose Road north eventually takes you to a T-junction. Continuing straight would keep you on what's now called Wild Rose Road. Taking left takes you onto Panamint Road. We followed Panamint Road all the way to the junction with Highway 190. Taking left brings you to the resort town of Panamint Springs. For travelers coming from Alancha, Panamint Springs serves as the entry point to the national park. There's a gas station, a motel, restaurant, and campground. Just a few minutes further west on 190 is the entrance to Darwin Falls, a waterfall that feeds the town and a surprising juxtaposition to the arid rock and gravel that surrounds it. However, I wasn't confident in my ability to take a Honda fit over the road, so we doubled back through Panamint Springs and across the valley to make the climb over town pass. This did give us the opportunity to appreciate the Panamint Range once more, with the snow-covered telescope peak offering a contrast to the dry lake bed we were traveling across. Sound. 
Climbing over Town Pass gradually takes you from an elevation of about 1,000 feet in Panamint Valley to just over 4,900 feet before gradually topping down into Death Valley proper. Town Pass is actually the scar of one of the many fault systems in the region that has split the Panamint block into the Cottonwood Mountains to the northwest and the Panamint Range to the southeast. The fault system, like many others, serves as a point in the bedrock where weathering from water and ice can creep in, gradually opening up the gap. Faults are rarely more than a few inches wide, but Town Pass itself is almost a mile wide in the southern half. Weathering and erosion while widening the gap also fill it in and smooth it out, allowing for the highway to easily make its way up and over. However, as the Death Valley 49ers discovered over 100 years ago, this is not always the case. Indeed, during the historic rainfalls of the 2022 monsoon season, Town Pass and every entrance into the park had to be shut down. Boulders were strewn across the asphalt, and in some places roads were completely washed out, a reminder of the power of water even in the driest place in North America. Paradoxically, climate change is not just prolonging droughts, but also intensifying desert storms. While individual weather events such as the storms of 2022 cannot be directly attributed to climate change, the overall pattern is clear. Death Valley has already experienced several one in a thousand year events within the last century alone. Thankfully, the road was clear when we made our way over. Route 190 exits Town Pass on an alluvial fan. Alluvial fans are deposits of gravel, sand, and other sediment created as water flows through the mountains, often in the desert in the form of flash floods. When the water meets the valley floor, it spreads out and the sediment is left behind, fanning out from the base of the mountains, hence the name. Death Valley National Park has many examples of alluvial fans, with those originating in the eastern face of the Panamint Range being the largest. This allows travelers a smooth ride down to the valley floor, despite the overall rapid drop in elevation. From here, it's only another 10 minutes or so to Stovepipe Wells. Stovepipe Wells is a way station and a sort of entry point for Death Valley itself, though well within the bounds of the park. There, travelers can set up camp and have access to the showers at the nearby hotel, as well as a small convenience store and a gas station. nicer than I expected. It is pretty much still a parking lot, but there's, there's tent sites and fire pits and tables. And you can actually even see the mesquite fly sand dunes. And there's this little car in there. Off in the distance that direction. And Louise and Angel aren't here yet. But tent, thankfully, this one was really easy to set up. Since Luis and Angel decided to leave that same morning, they were still about an hour and a half behind us. As we were climbing over the Panamint Range, they were still driving through Cyril's Valley. Like Panamint Valley and Death Valley, Cyril's is a result of the same basin and range extension described earlier, and, like many of those valleys, is also home to a dry lake bed. During the Ice Ages, Cyril's Lake was at times up to 660 feet deep. With warmer temperatures and a significant decrease in precipitation, Cyril's Lake eventually dried up, leaving behind abundant quantities of sodium and potassium minerals. Mining the dry lake bed of Borax started in the 1800s. Later in 1913, the small town of Trona was founded by a mining company to house the company employees. Today, Trona is home to about 1900 residents, the primary employee being Cyril's Valley Mineral Inc. A small window of the desert isolation ahead, Trona famously has a high school football field made of dirt. Any grass is killed by the high temperatures and the salt levels in the soil. At one point, it even had a golf course, which was also entirely made of sand and dirt.
All right. Say hello. Hold on. <laughs> We've Let's made it. Hello back, because Luis has gotten a lot of rejections today. Buenos dias. <laughs> uh, you what? know. Because you'd say hello to everyone who passed by, and they oh, yeah, all ignore like, you. Why are everyone <laughs> on the vehicles like all the car, car coming? I nothing. That's so why I was like, if he says hello, you gotta say hello back. You know, he's faced a lot of rejection today. <laughs> but this is Stovepipe Wells Campground. It's not too hot, thankfully. Uh, Luis and Angel set up both of their tents. And ours is there. Got coolers and food, and we're gonna be heading out in uh, maybe like half an hour or less to Ubi Hibi Craters. Volcanic explosion craters about an hour north of here. You want me to hold it outside? Which is like, I don't know. Ah, uh, you can just leave it inside so it doesn't make too much noise interference. Which is cost you? I don't want to call, I'm not lying. I was like, oh. Does that mean mean to get one? After setting up camp and having lunch, we set off to Yubi Hibi Crater. Located at the northern end of the Cottonwood Mountains, Yubi Hibi Crater is the youngest and largest of several volcanic explosion craters and debris cones. Almost half a mile across and over 600 feet deep, Yubi Hibi Crater was formed approximately 2100 years ago. Magma making its way through weak points in the crust came into contact with groundwater. When this happened, the water explosively flashed into steam forming Yubi Hibi, as well as Little Hibi and several other craters in that volcanic field. A recent study suggests that pyroclastic flows, clouds of hot volcanic rock, ash, and gas might have flowed as far as 10 to 15 kilometers or 6 to 9 miles away from the crater. The name Yubi Hibi is often said to be the Timbisha word for Big Bowl, but this is actually incorrect. The Timbisha named the crater Wosa, the Timbisha word for Burden Basket. In Timbisha legend, the god Coyote carried humanity in a burden basket to where Yubi Hibi is now. Tired and cold, he decided to rest for the night, starting a small campfire to keep himself warm. The basket caught on fire, however, and humanity scattered in fear. Coyote ran to a pool of water to cool off the burns on his back, but when he turned around he saw smoke and the ground burning, rocks and debris flying into the air. After running west, Coyote eventually turned back to look, where he saw a massive hole which he decided to name Wosa after the basket he was carrying. I had originally planned a hike around the rim of Hibi Hibi. The trail also takes you up to Little Hibi, one of the smaller craters of the volcanic field. I quickly discovered how out of shape I was, however. The slight incline and loose gravel took the breath out of me quickly. That, along with the wind that seems ever present here, was enough to convince me to turn back. But not before snapping some photos and capturing some b-roll. Luis and Angel, however, decided not just to tackle Little Hibi, but Yubi Hibi itself, descending down the steep gravel and ash-laden walls all the way to the crater floor. What I didn't know at the time was that this would mark the start of a sort of running joke that Angel decided to come up with. This guy here to the crater. It's about one o'clock. We'll see how this running joke plays on later. Kite. 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 Kite.
Finally made it back to base camp. It's about one o'clock, you know? After the hour and 30 minute drive back from Ubihibi, Sydney and I settled in, hoping to take a quick nap before Luis and Angel got back. We didn't actually know at the time that they decided to tackle the crater, and it wasn't until nearly two hours later that they got back. Dinner wasn't anything too fancy. I believe I just made some hot dogs. And in any case, what I was most excited about was the prospect of a clear night sky in Death Valley. 